This is ADT 1160U, Digital Communication Technologies. Well, I'm with uh, Alec Kuros tonight. It's September 16, uh, 2013. And uh, thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview for the students. Uh, the first question is, we know that you're an avid user of social media. Well, we see you everywhere, actually. <laughs> and we wondered what triggered your interest. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Is the audio level okay? Absolutely. So for okay. So yes, that's a that's a good question. Um, so I actually, when I started my uh, PhD work uh, back in the late 1990s, um, I had planned to do some other uh, topic, more more on sort of more of a generic approach to integrating technology into education, and I. I very accidentally came across a, a book by the name of uh, The Cathedral in the Bazaar by Eric Raymond. And it was basically, it was, it, was, uh, it was about open source software. And in particular, it was about open source software communities. And it was uh, these really rich, basically discussing how these really rich communities move away from a, a, a cathedral approach to developing software to a much more bizarre approach. And so it was much more chaotic in ways. And so I was very interested from that point on in sort of hacker cultures and looking at um, how people collaborate differently. And there was this spirit and this ethos within these hacker communities, which was really interesting because I'm an educator. I was thinking, how can we apply some of this, this you know, the spirit of collaboration and reflection and really what you would call a gift economy in teacher spaces? So my dissertation topic was uh, around this connected educator um, and how basically the, the idea of that any educator, and of course it's even more now, can be connected to a number of different tools, whether it's blogging or bookmarking or curation tools. But beyond that, beyond the tools, those are just the interfaces to, uh, to rich interactions with others and of course opportunities for collaboration and so on. So really, when it comes down to my, my use of social media, it's, it's always been around how can we better collaborate? How do we create, uh, you know, this, the spirit of these hacker communities. And hacker, you know, back then wasn't used in a very derogatory term. It was much more a, a creative culture and still is, I think, in, in, those, in those cases, um, you know, the, the hacker culture. But how do we bring that spirit into uh, educational communities that are often disconnected and, and in, the, in the case of Saskatchewan you look at you may have one arts education in, in a small northern school which would be the similar in, in some scenarios to your own province and you have that person is very disconnected they only have uh, a very small network perhaps their family their friends a few resources and certainly the internet has expanded that but the internet is not simply about um, getting information anymore, it's about connecting to people who happen to have information, who have curated and and who have qualified information for you already. So I think that's really what it comes down to is, is you know, the, the need to see a more collaborative spirit within educator communities. You know, I, in my classes, we really try to deconstruct that, that, that nurse, you know, the narcissist uh, sort of approach and the egoism and, and all of that, the, the, you know, the, the, the culture of selfies. And so even today, I was working with undergrads today, and we, we, we look at sort of the differences between connected and, you know, disconnected cultures. But even, like right now, I am totally aware of my audience. I mean, to an extent, I know you're my audience, but I have no idea beyond that. You know, and, and you look at Dana Boyd's work uh, around uh, context collapse, and Michael Wesch talks about that as well. So I have no idea who's going to view this, what their context is, and so if you look from like a sociological construct, uh, I'm doing face work right now, but I don't, you know, face work is this idea of being able to understand my context enough to represent myself. But beyond that, you know, we have kids looking into Snapchat, you know, into, you know, into their cameras without any sense of context. And so, you know, for me, the only way to go is, you know, beyond the sort of this, the self, I guess, in this particular sense, and for me, social media, the, the, I mean, it's a bit disconnected from that earlier thought, but it really comes out to this idea of, I mean, social media really means social and collaborative and, and uh, you know, using these tools in a way that we could not have, you know, done things before. The wisdom of crowds from Granovetter, all of this sort of, um, or the strength of weak ties, I'm sorry, um, from Granovetter's work. And, and uh, you know, so it's really, to me, it's really important that 
we harness these technologies not for ourselves but for our communities. Question two, I've listened to you teach online and, and your courses are quite intense. Actually I got inspired because I needed to learn how to do it and I'm like, how does he manage all of that? You know, where is his brain all over the place? Um, can you talk about what goes on in a typical course? What do you do and what do the students do? Uh, yeah, it depends which course um, I'm teaching. So I, I'll give you a snapshot of somewhere in between because I do teach undergrad face-to-face -face courses, which may be a bit different than some of the ones that I teach online. Um, let's see. So I think you know, in both classes, one of the things that we really do work on is the idea of developing personal learning networks. So. You know, I, I, from a structural standpoint, uh, content is important, and we certainly discuss a lot of media, and we learn tools, and sort of the, especially in the undergraduate um, areas, we, you know, we spend some time on the technology. But it's it's a it's a great departure from learning keyboarding, which you know some of the courses that I teach used to be the keyboarding classes from the 1980s and 1990s even, and then all of a sudden, even you know. When I started teaching my first undergraduate courses, we did something called HyperCard or Hyper Studio, where you basically create, it's almost like creating connected PowerPoint slides, almost a precursor to the web. It was very, very interesting. So, um, anyway, so we've gone away from the tools, and it's about really learning how to learn. And I think that's, you know, a very ideal. And so it's not just about, you know, sharpening, sharpening your research skills and, um, you know, learning how to find resources and those sorts of things. I guess in some ways the latter statement does still hold, but the resources now are people and um, being able to connect to educators through, say, a hashtag um, or through a Twitter list or through educational blogs. Um, you know, typically some of the things that I get teachers, uh, especially my undergrads, as well as the graduate students to do, um, we, we work on reflection so through reflection blog, reflective blogs. Blogs are always mandatory in my classes. Um, you know, working on, again, reflection, but of course a big part of that is developing audience and understanding audience and who do we write for and understanding that uh, blog writing is, is a form of social writing. It's not the same as writing in text. And there are particular affordances like hyperlinks, uh, video embeds, you know, within our writing, pingbacks, which are really important to be able to inform someone that you're talking about them. Um, these are things that are really important. So reflection is a big, curation is very big. We used to do things like delicious bookmarks or Digo, and now we spend a lot of time, students will use Pinterest or Scoopus, Scoopit or other ones, and, 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 and the idea is you're not just collecting information, and I think that's a big departure. It's You're also not only qualifying each piece that you get, you're also providing a structure or a taxonomy or a system of classification and organization. So when you actually create something in a board, you're actually uh, sharing not only the artifacts themselves, but how you classify those articles. And I think that's really important. So reflection, curation, connection, which is probably the next big one, looking at the idea of you know, connecting, developing your PLM, and of course, creating and spending a lot of time moving beyond consumption and being able to develop things. So we spend time uh, creating digital stories. Digital storytelling is big, and that, that also ties in very much with the sort of uh, oral culture that we, um, uh, especially the, the work that we do with indigenous cultures as well, um, you know, uh, valuing oralities and, and looking at that as uh, alternate forms to literacy. Um, so anyway, yeah, so that's kind of the framework. Reflect, curate, connect, and create. Um, one of the other big projects that we do is something called the Learning Project. And it's a lot of fun because we basically, I get students to basically anything that they want to learn that's complex and from their point of view, very uh, worthwhile, uh, worthwhile learning. So finding something to learn that they would have not normally found in a class, and sometimes it's arts related, sometimes it's content related. Uh, and then what they do is they use both face-to-face -face and online sources to learn. So sometimes they, um, they, they learn how to do something in a face-to-face -face situation. They, they contact local people, but in many cases it's YouTube um, videos or resources or whatever else. But a big part of this is that they actually have to document the progress of their learning online, usually through YouTube videos. So I get students learning guitar. So at the beginning of the semester, they you know they strum a few chords, and then you can actually see how they connect over time. 
and how they actually have shared their learning with the world and also with that they're sharing their vulnerabilities and and you know how to learn so the whole idea is how do we learn differently i guess in this culture it's not no longer simply about finding the appropriate resources but it's also about connecting with people whether it's face to face or online because that's part of the same duality i think um you know that we actually uh, can learn in different ways uh, there's a great example of that uh, actually one of my co-instructors dean shiresky um, he decided to learn guitar online and, and uh, he was able to connect he tweeted something and he connected um uh, with a with an instructor in connecticut so he's from moose jaw saskatchewan and he he basically put some videos online he wasn't getting very far and and then uh this music teacher said you know what i'm going to get my students to create videos for dean so here's dean's videos and, and these high school students who decided to create videos to help dean you know so it was really kind of cool that high school teachers were teaching this university professor how to play guitar and that really just showed me like this is just so much more than you know just a project it's it's a, it's a way of, of living and learning digital age so it was a fun project right right so that's some of the things we do i mean i could go on but i think that might give you a, a capture it's, it's very eclectic it's very student driven um uh, as dave cormier says we use a term i think the, the term he uses is it's a, a community as curriculum and I, I like that idea that it's always evolving that we certainly have a set uh curriculum that we have to go through but it really it depends on the needs uh, of learners. With all the products available for teaching and interacting online, do you think some platform or software are better than others to teach online or to interact online? Or and, and if so, what characteristics do they have without, you know, just talking about the brand, just in terms of the affordances for your own taste? Sure, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm a big advocate of, first of all, open source tools and, and, and tools that you can whether it's a, a good API or something that you can adapt. So for instance, one of the best tools I've used lately is you know WordPress because we do all sorts of good things. It's a blogging platform, but it's you know a really fantastic, adaptable. Um, I mean, you can publish you know, journals with it. We've, we've actually created a sort of a journal system with it. Um, you know, and it, it provides a number of different tools, uh, parts of it. So it, it, the tool itself wouldn't apply to all uh, everything you wanted to do, but because it's adaptable and open and has a great developer community, it's it's something I'd, I'd like a lot more than than something you get from a particular brand or a proprietary brand. Um, I think platform um, gets sticky. I mean, even the term platform. Um, I really uh, subscribe to the approach of, of uh, small tools loosely joined rather than the monolith approach to. Um, you know, like a course management system or a learning management system. Uh, most of those try to tries to do everything but does nothing well. And so we see that sort of idea. So most of the courses I teach use, like for instance, the course I'm teaching right now, we use um, every student has their own blog because they can take it with them when they're done. And it's something, you know, if they want to delete it, that's great. But if they want to take it into something else, and, and for me to see students who have taken a course and who continue to blog year after year after my course is done versus the learning management system where we have no respect for student work and we just delete everything after the semester is and, you know, forget that community that we just created. We didn't really mean to create a community. We just wanted to create a really, I mean, temporary communities are, are important too, but I think we have a total and utter disregard for communities when we just archive them. Um, so I, I get students to create um, content in their own spaces, which they often develop into portfolios, and they continue to blog beyond. Okay, so we're so in the class I'm teaching right now. Uh, I have a main blog. Every student has their own blog. We use aggregation tools to bring everything together. Uh, I do that for students, but they also do it in their own ways. Um, students will use curation tools. Uh, we use uh, Twitter with a shared hashtag um, that allows everyone to see where people are sharing. And then for our kind of our closest and most vulnerable interactions we actually use a Google Plus community which has been really really good because it has uh, one of the great things about it it's not it's not an open tool but it uh, has um, you know sort of the, the, the necessities of say a, of a, um, a forum but it's much more it's much prettier <laughs> in one thing than most of your chat forums the Google yeah Google Plus community 
um, you can you can embed any sort of um, media, which is really good, videos or text or Google Docs or whatever else. Um, um, you have the option of just getting into spontaneous and serendipitous um, uh, chat, uh, hangouts. You know, this idea that you can just basically click on a button and you're and you're chatting or video conferencing with three or four people or up to ten people. That's been really cool because people may be, you know, working late at night, looking through this, they see each other online and they decided to all of a sudden form a little bit of a, a conference. And I really like those spontaneous ones that come out of class. Um, so really when it comes down to it, for me, it's, it's joining a bunch of tools together and bringing them together in ways that, I mean, that, that fits your class rather than choosing one particular thing that's already done you know it's all done the integration is nice sure you know it, you know you know exactly you have one login you go through it I get that sort of stuff but that's not very realistic when it comes to real life and you know and how many kids outside of school I mean the authentic nature of those things as well like I don't hear many students say hey I can't wait to go home to SharePoint this or you know you know send it up to my my LMS like no one talks like that the fourth question um, is, uh, is as follows when reviewing social media landscapes in the last few years one notices that social media categories or trends evolved some merged some disappeared others surfaced how do you explain this evolution yeah, so, so that's a you know that's a good question, and I haven't. I mean, I I, I mean, I sort of know what's here, and I've been in the field long enough to kind of get a sense of what's here and what's not. You know, we've certainly seen, like for for in blogging, for instance, we've gone from long form blogging to tumble blogs like Tumblr and Posters and and those sorts of things. We've moved, um, you know, from social di uh, bookmarking to social curation, which is not just a visual and aesthetic change; it's actually a change in how we again sort of organized knowledge um, and of course you know the sharing pieces we've actually gone from um, you know tools that were a lot more free to tools that are a lot less free um, I remember Zuckerberg saying something like Facebook's Facebook's uh, goal is to create a more open and connected society but from um, what 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 I think they're doing is actually just creating uh, and you know, in America Online, old AOL sort of model, where you basically back in the day where you didn't really log into the internet, you logged into their infrastructure, and you're seeing that with you know sort of the shape where you're seeing the big providers like Google and Facebook and Twitter to some expect to um, um, in some way to really um, have creating these silos of identity and silos of you know sort of these platforms that everyone else uses. You know, and, and there's a lot of these tools that you log into Facebook, and I kind of get the appeal. I mean, I certainly get the appeal where people don't want multiple logins and they want to be able to just you get into with Facebook. But we, but the other thing, of course, with all of this is as you know, one the the because there's so many of these tools, the communication standard has gotten from paragraphs to you know 140 characters. Uh, you've moved from YouTube to Vine, you know, from a limited number, it used to be actually 10 minutes, the limit's on YouTube, but now it's unlimited to, you know, seven seconds. And so I think as you see more and more people go out and get online, there's more noise. Um, and it, it's actually amazing to me. It's, I watch Vine videos once in a while and I laugh at them because I'm thinking, you know, this person... In seven seconds, they accomplished to make me laugh in a really good and original way. So sometimes, you know, if you look at any of the creativity literature, creativity needs constraints, and sometimes seven seconds. If you can make me laugh in seven seconds, you you've been creative probably, or or totally ridiculous. But 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 I think so. I think that's a big a big trend is we're actually although it seems like we're you know the the, the media companies tell us we're getting more open, we're actually getting more closed and siloed. Um, we're moving from um, when we move to things like social curation um, because originally like things like Pinterest we're really more about marketing like it's not it's I you know the, the companies themselves don't care how you would organize a classroom information structure They're, they want to know how do we how do I tap into you as an aggregate 
to figure out all the nice things you want for your wedding or for your baking or whatever you're doing because um, that was the original market and they're, and they're getting this amazing demographic um, and you know and data from all of this and so really I mean it's becoming much more you know consumer based and and the, the decisions around this are much more from a marketing approach uh, you know in the old saying goes you've probably heard this many times it's sort of like you know Facebook is not uh, you know you're not their customer you're the you're their product you know the thing that they package and sell to their real customer which is um, you know the, the, the marketing companies and so on so I think you know that's certainly a change too so shorter attention spans more people posting and I think uh, bigger silos I think is becoming the big trends but I don't think all is lost I think seeing things like the the maker movement uh, little tools like the Makey Makeys and, and the Arduinos and the Raspberry Pis, you're seeing from this sort of, uh, from this, you know, you, you think from this manifest destiny of the of the big marketing companies that people are actually pulling back and saying, you know what, we, we can no longer look inside these boxes and not know what's going on in them, inside them. We need to actually spend some time understanding what's inside each of these black boxes and you know if we're going to control our destiny we need to control our spaces um gardner campbell in terms of you know he he's a big advocate for having your own space so not a, a facebook page is not good enough for you you need your own space on the internet which he calls calls a personal cyber infrastructure and he says every single person needs needs their own personal cyber infrastructure and i wouldn't argue too much against that but anyway so that's that's the, the nice side whether there'll be enough people to sort of stop the decay of what the internet is and if whether the you know if the internet as we know it will just be a folk tour a folk tale of you know decades gone long ago and we'll talk about it you know back in the day when we could download whatever we wanted and share what, whatever we wanted with whoever we wanted it might be a fantasy someday but i sure hope not but it could have the 40s <laughs> so it makes me you know sad but i think just i think the measure of who we are ultimately is well beyond selfies and and the ego Statistical sort of use of technologies. We have to look at technology in a way that we bring back the human, and I think that's ultimately the, the greatest thing that we can learn. Is whenever we look at a technology, we have to understand: does this technology humanize or dehumanize what we do? And ultimately, I think that's the standard for all technology. That's a great word of wisdom. Thank you so much. No problem. My pleasure. <laughs>